Welcome to For the Record, which is a conversation series where we speak with music heads about their stories and the music that makes them. Um, hey, Lonnie, welcome to the show. It's really great to have you here. So happy to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. Um, to begin, I always like to start at the beginning and, and just uh explore your relationship with music you know when it started how it started um and then kind of work our way forward from there Ooh. oh uh diving deep right away um <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh i grew up playing music uh my mom was a music teacher um mm. self-taught at first um and then she proceeded to get a second uh the first time she went to school, she studied uh, biology, I think, and was maybe going to become a vet or go to med school. But um, then she ended up kind of on an adventure across the country and landed in Hawaii, uh, which is where I was born. And when I was in elementary school, she went back to school. Well, all of my childhood, she was teaching uh, like private music lessons and classes at the YMCA. And, um, you know, so I grew up like from a very young age playing music and us always singing together and then when I was in elementary and middle school she got a second bachelor's in music and a master's in music and eventually a PhD in electronic music when I was in high school in my first years of college um, and then she went on to become a music professor uh, after that so um, she's actually just retired <laughs> last year um, and uh, yeah, so I always uh, was around music and playing music and um, yeah, I, I was pursuing music as my primary uh, professional intention for a time, like in my earlier years. And then I kind of um, was taken on a slightly different path towards visual art um, in my mid twenties. I started taking photos and um, I was coming up against, you know, musically quite a bit of creative dissatisfaction uh, around what I was creating at that time. And then I was, my mom gave me a camera one year for Christmas and I started taking pictures and um, yeah, that kind of just like sent me on a whole new uh, wave. And um, a few years later, I was invited to make my first uh, art installation. And um, yeah, so I started going a more visual path, but after a few years of doing that, um, I started to get a very uh, resounding message from the cosmos that music wanted to re-enter my creative practice. And, um, and specifically, I would hear in my meditations that I was meant to bring people to sing together. And I could like see it in my mind, but I remember feeling like, Oh, this is so beautiful like it would make me cry in my meditation just seeing it but um mm. i was like i don't know how to do this <laughs> and um yeah just in the in the years after that a dear friend of mine uh initiated a project called open source community choir um which uh is not a choir in a traditional sense but it's a uh, open source process for singing together and bringing our voices together it's primarily improvised group harmonization and um, so this practice has become a foundational element in um, many of my participatory uh, performance pieces that I've done over in collaboration with other musicians and artists over the last like, seven years or so. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, at that at that point of uh, bringing music back in, I started. Uh, I make these large scale immersive installations, often using um, uh, ephemeral natural materials, plants and fabric and paper, and um, and I started uh, activating these spaces uh, with these participatory improvisational music and movement performances, um, and I started collaborating with musicians in the community, like. Um, Carlos Nino, Aaron Shaw, uh, Nate Mercero, Josh Johnson are some of the ones that have uh, co-created these experiences with me. Um, and yeah, um, I guess maybe that brings us to uh, genre, um, all genre, 
Summer Dow, uh, this project that I'm a co-founder of, um, which is a decentralized community wing of Weaving Records. And um, yeah, I started to get really uh, more involved and engaged with that community. And um, yeah, presently we're building a digital community garden, genre.garden is the URL. And we're looking at how we can take, um, you know, the things that I think all of us as artists uh, at this moment in time are like be exhausted from being so very online and particularly like on Instagram and feeling like dependent on it for our careers, um, but also feeling overwhelmed and exhausted by the experience. So we're trying to, um, I got really excited, you know, it's so funny, this uh, Twitter space you invited me to be a part of. Mm. Um, with Mike Sugarman, because right. last spring I read the paper about VSOPs, very small online spaces, uh, platforms rather. I'd like to say spaces because I love the word platform so much. But, that... <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I read that I read that paper, and uh, we had already been kind of talking about building some kind of an alternative uh, social space online for the community, and that really concretized the vision of uh, what we wanted to do and. Yeah, so over the last like five or six months, we've been building Genre Garden, which um, the first two projects are a community created archive of um, news, uh, footage from the monthly community concerts that Leaving Records hosts here in LA uh, at Elysian Park, um, and, and as well as a community uh, calendar that's collectively published. So for the archive, there's a, they, they all live on a website. This all lives on a website, genre.garden. And for the archive, uh, there's a Google form that um, the community can submit their footage from the park shows to. Um, and then for the calendar, um, there's a, similarly, there's a type form that artists can go and it has um, inputs for uh, date, time, flyer, artist name, description, and a link to tickets. And so, yeah, we're really just trying to like take the things that are positive and beneficial to us from Instagram and replicate them in a smaller uh, environment that is non extractive, that is not based on any kind of attention economics, and that uh, can be, you know, uh, mutually beneficial to those that are participating in it. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I want to make a note also that, that your your collectively published calendar is what inspired us you know here via create coalition to do something similar it's why there's a question in you know in the air table form that asks about any upcoming events that you might have so we can also collectively curate you know these events from people in our community so so wanted to say thank you you know for that inspiration um that's so nice i was delighted when i saw that on your on your <laughs> form um <laughs> It's something we all really love to do, right? Like that's one of the things I love using Instagram for, uh, particularly the stories is like sharing um, other things going on in the community that I'm excited about or, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of the things that I really enjoy about participating in Instagram. And right now, one of the things that we're working on is creating like um, an identity attribution system for the calendar so essentially when you uh we're going to invite more than just like at this point we've just been inviting artists to share their own shows but in the next phase uh with this identity system we'll invite other community members uh and, and the artists to share not only their own shows but other shows that they're excited about and then uh under the calendar event it will say that it was shared by them um, and then they also have like a profile page that you can see all the shows that they've shared to the calendar over time. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to experiment with these kinds of, um, yeah, these, mm, you know, curatorial uh, sharing and, you know, the th again, the things that we like love about these uh, existing social spaces, how can we experiment with them on a small scale yeah yeah i love that uh yeah i've had the line you know like uh, curation is care in my head 
you know, for a long mm. period of time. And I know I came from Glenn Pope, who I know you also know, and and uh, and that has really become you know kind of a brain worm um in you know, like in the best <laughs> way possible uh in thinking just just kind of trying to reconceptualize these uh you know very broad and you know flatter platforms like instagram um and you know reconceptualizing them in more intimate ways more intentional ways like you are you know doing with losing records and mm. like doing the genre um yeah, and there's just, you know, a lot of potential to do that. And it, it's, you know, it feels like there's more and more momentum, you know, behind the shift in that direction, which, you know, I think is really heartening. Or at least or at least that's how it feels with the people that I spend time with. So I, I don't know the, if that's indicative of, like, a larger movement, but but it feels like there's something there. Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting thing. I think the word curation or curator um, for some, it can elicit like this elitist institution uh, thinking, you know, that like there are the curators and there are the gatekeepers, you know. But I think one of the things that um, I'm really curious about is like, especially um, playing with some Web3 tools, there's these really uh, novel models for decentralized community curation mechanisms. To emerge and I think that um, that has the potential to disrupt these uh, like entrenched hierarchical power structures of curation and yeah I'm curious like you know at this at this moment there's all of these sort of like small spaces small, small networks um, emerging and how there might be like meta labels or meta networks that are like you know that we're vibing with those ones because we vibe with other people in the network and so there becomes this kind of like you can return to this fun exploratory experience online rather than this feeling that the social spaces we're spending time in are just like marketing to us all the time right right yeah 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 i think the non-extractive nature of some of you know, these emergent communities and these emergent you know whatever you want to call them smaller networks or like you could you know, call them meta label um you, you know is you know again really heartening to see those come you know, you know into the world and hopefully i hope they can uh you know provide kind of a new template for the ways in which you know we think about curation we think about uh connection and and cultivating you know community in online spaces. Um, I want to go back to something that you said earlier. Um, when you were coming up and you were pursuing music, uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned that before your mom gave you a camera, you had been, you know, pursuing music and, and having this this moment of creative dissatisfaction. And I'm curious what was causing that. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think, have you ever heard this, um, um, oh, Ira Glass, oh, well, it's not really a quote, it's kind of like a little speech ramble <laughs> about the creative process. Um, he basically says uh, the, that almost all creative people, when you're first making um, art yourself um, or any creative work, um, you have a uh, good taste because you've um you know spent time looking at other people's art and so you know what you like and you know what you don't and almost inevitably for the first phase or wave of you trying to create your own work you're going to come up against this um like gap it's called the artist gap i believe that's what this this talk is called um it's an excerpt from like one of his uh radio show segments um but yeah, he says there's this gap that uh, between what you're making and what you like and um, that every interesting creative person he knows has gone through this phase. And sometimes it lasts for many years where you just can't live up to your own taste. And um, I was really in that gap of not satisfied or excited about what I was creating and 
I think when I dial into it a little bit deeper also, you know, this was like uh, early 2000s and like through the, the first decade of the 2000s, right? And I think like culturally, we were really in the peak of um, like Paris Hilton, you know, like, <laughs> like just this like, you know, it's like this culture of like homogeneity and um mm -hmm. and i was really trying to be like something rather than really deeply exploring myself creatively and i think that's ultimately why i was unhappy with what i was making is that you know like i made i recorded a record that i never put out that was um like auto tuned <laughs> like you know it just like it was with this kind of like not great not very not very nice producer you know who like um you know it just like I didn't feel I think like care like more broadly at that time I I was in a wave where I didn't feel like myself or I was trying to be something I wasn't I was just living in LA I just moved to LA from Santa Cruz where I went to college which Santa Cruz interestingly enough is like very a very be yourself kind of a place it's very like let your freak flag fly kind of a place and then I moved to Los Angeles West Hollywood specifically and it was like the peak I was living like actually right in the middle of all of these like nightclubs where like Lindsay Lohan and Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie and all these like you know like tabloid celebrities were like getting drunk and getting into crashes with paparazzis and you know it was like really the epicenter of that and so I think like you know the culture I was immersed in was very flat and I was also really young. So I was just like really trying to find my unique self. And an interesting thing about the move from music to camera is um, there's a simplicity of taking pictures, especially with a digital camera that you can practice and uh, understand. Like, like I was able to practice and evolve relatively quickly because I got excited about it. and music is a much slower process that really requires patience and long devotion <laughs> over time. And I think the instant, uh, I want to say gratification, more like the rapid evolution that's made possible with digital photography really helped me feel confident and motivated and excited about what I was making. Um, and it enabled me to then stretch into these other territories. And what's funny is like when I came back to music after creating this visual art foundation, I felt much clearer, probably also just like in my own personal spiritual evolution, right? Of like who I am and what I came, what I've come here to do. And so it was easier for me maybe just even emotionally to step into this new place um or return rather to this musical place in my heart um with a newfound sense of myself artistically and to come to it from that understanding rather than this like I'm gonna be a musician I gotta get on tour like the, even the whole mindset of that time it was like you're trying to get discovered by someone else. Like some producer is going to discover you and make you a star. Or some more established musician is going to ask you to open for them on tour. There was like all of this power dynamics that were rooted in like this external authority, external validation, rather than really diving into myself and finding what moved me uh, personally and to create from that place. And now I feel much in a much better position to make art that is coming from that heart-centered inner awareness of of my own identity and what what makes me come alive mm. wow amazing that's really beautiful uh, and and that's such a journey also to get to that place uh i i, th I think it's um one of the most arduous journeys perhaps that you can embark upon with with all of the noise it's very difficult to abstract yourself you know from this need to be validated or need to be discovered by somebody to attract attention you know given all these platforms that that we rely upon you know in which to be social and to connect with people um and yeah 
yeah what you said about you know requiring patience for music like you know as an art form that that also really resonates and you know i have to give a shout out to mark who's in the audience um i was just in scotland mm -hmm. and i was recording music with him uh <laughs> and uh I, I recorded the song that he has already already recorded and entirely mixed two times uh but wasn't wasn't happy with it in, in you know, <laughs> this gap again that that you were talking about and uh it, yeah yeah he very graciously recorded it for the third time and mixed it and uh um so yeah it's you know it's a long process and uh you know i hear you it's a little intimidating <laughs> um when you just you know you have something you like and you just want it to exist in the world in a certain way and you, you know there's no way to bypass all of this all of this hard work um so all that said i'm curious it, you know now in this position that that you're in and like really feeling like you you know you can channel your um your true authentic self when you create when you create art in you know how does in you know has music taken you know i know that you're involved in work with music and music community but but has like like have you returned it all to you know to some of those roots uh you know 10 15 years ago where you were thinking about becoming a musical artist like has that has that reemerged have you have you been making music on your own or is it still like in community alongside the choir i'm curious to hear where you're at with it Yeah. Um, so my partner, David Moses, uh, he got us a piano for my birthday last year. Um, and that has been a huge uh, opening or shift for me. Um, when I was pursuing music, I was mostly singing and playing guitar. And uh I was always very limited by my technical guitar abilities. Even though I've been playing like most of my life, I was never very disciplined on going with guitar. And so I wouldn't practice uh, very consistently. And so when I was uh, pursuing music with guitar I, and, and writing songs, I was always really like limited by that. And there's something about piano. We, we always had pianos when I was growing up, but I didn't them very seriously I think because I had this idea in my mind that like I needed to play guitar so that it was easy to play shows that I could take it with me or something I had all these like preconceived notions about it but since I've been playing piano again um that's really unlocked this I, I love we found this piano at a, a thrift store and I just like fell in love with it the sound everything it goes out of tune you know <laughs> but it's like there's something about it that I just feel so emotionally connected with it and um, yeah, I've been playing, uh, we play together. He just started uh, like less than a year ago. Uh, my mom gave him a cello. <laughs> so we've been playing cello and guitar together. And uh, I'm mean, sorry, cello and piano together. And uh, a dear friend of ours, Ed Mazurik, uh, Wild Molasses is his musical name. We just laid down a session with Ed Plays Sax. Um, with the three of us with sax, piano, and cello, and some experimental weirdness in there as well. Um, and yeah, I'm, uh, okay, so I don't know that I will ever go exactly back. I don't think, I don't sense that I will go back to making what I was making then, or even the same format or performance format. But I am feeling that it's very important to bring my voice back in uh, more presently. And I've been making, um, I don't know if I'll make a record, although I, I would like to do that. I don't have a record made that I would like to make, but I would like to make a record at some point. Um, although I think it might be participatory in nature. Like I have kind of this inkling of an idea um, you know, they have some of these, like, from the 60s and 70s, these, like, sing-along records, um, and I have kind of an idea to make something that, um, you know, takes the open source choir idea and uh, is a collection of instrumentals that are meant to be sung with improvisationally in a group. Um, so I would like to make that record, but um, <laughs> I, um, uh, yeah, I've been making these audiovisual pieces. I showed one in uh, a gallery, uh, Ochi Projects, uh, at their. They have one location in LA and another in 
Sun Valley, Idaho. And so I showed an installation there at the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023. That was an immersive installation that had a projected video um, inside of it. And the video uh, is comprised of both the, um, well, it, it, it incorporates video and audio from um, these past performance pieces. So I've been experimenting with like collaging the sound and the video uh, artifacts that have been created during these performances and making music from them. So I can see that, um, which, which by the way, has totally been uh, creatively frustrating. <laughs> Learning to edit um, and doing engaging in that process has totally brought me like into such a humbling return uh, to like not knowing beginner's mind and you know, for me, music, it's so much about the feeling. Um, I'm really always seeking to create and really experience um, music that touches spirit, art that touches spirit. I, I think like when something makes me cry, that's my greatest signal that I've found success. <laughs> um, totally. So yes, yeah, so I've been taking these digital artifacts uh, from the performances. Uh, for example, I did a performance um, with uh, collaborator Summer Bowie um, and my partner David Moses in uh, an exhibition I was, uh, a solo exhibition I had at the Philosophical Research Society called And So We Blossom Gently Into the Infinite Garden. Um, and uh, this exhibition, I had an essay that came out at the same time that the exhibition opened in Otra magazine by the same title. and. I had interviewed, this was kind of my entry actually into the Web3 community. I had interviewed like 20 some odd people working in Web3 across many different fields. And uh, the thesis or exploration of this exhibition and the essay um, were that at this moment in human history as our consciousness is evolving into a, um, an understanding of everyone and everything is interdependent and interconnected, that we're evolving into this unity consciousness, that um, decentralized technologies like blockchains are emerging both as a direct reflection of that shift in consciousness, as well as um, a uh, emerging as a technological economic scaffolding to support our evolution into this more beautiful world um, that our hearts know is possible. Oh, there's in stanzas. Um, and so throughout the duration of the exhibition, we did several of these participatory performance uh, pieces, including one of them, Tend to Care, which is um, an exploration of um, the ways in which we care for ourselves, each other, and the uh, world that we inhabit. And um, David Moses created an original uh, score that he performed live uh, during the performance where Summer and I engaged in this um, there was a, a little bit of choreography, but it was mostly improvisational of the, an embodiment of this, these acts of care of self and each other and coming in and out of synchronization and harmony. And, um, and then, so we did another expression of Tend to Care um, on the LA River uh, a year later uh, with Aaron Shaw playing saxophone and, um, open source choir members coming and singing and the group, the whole group sang together. Um, and then we did as uh, Aaron Shaw played and um, and as we sang, we did a, a trash cleanup along the LA river um, and, uh, and cared for this space uh, and expressed this concept in this way. And so, for the video piece, uh, Earth Dance, that I showed with Ochi Projects, I took the audio from um, the instrumental piece that David Moses made for the Tend to Care at PRS and uh, collaged it with the both the saxophone um, that Aaron Shaw played on the river, that we recorded on the river, as well as the, the vocalist singing uh, on the river. And um, this became the soundtrack of the video piece. Cool. I love that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, this idea of collage is really beautiful, and just like music, you know, music mm -hmm. as the vehicle or the background, uh, you know, to these <laughs> other acts of care that you know that are surrounding it. I think is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. 
yeah, I mean, I loved also your your definition of the blockchain as like both a reflection <laughs> of <laughs> of like an elevating consciousness while also you know providing the uh, the uh, technological and economic uh, you know kind of scaffolding of of that next journey of and that's uh yeah, that's great. It's very succinct, and I think you know it provides words to something that was kind of in my head, but you know hadn't been so eloquent as that. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, I I would love now to transition to uh, more of kind of the Q and A section of of this, in which I ask you about more more of the music that that you spend time listening to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, perhaps the music that. You know that does make you cry. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay. And the first, or oh, yeah, first, I would love to to ask how how you discover music today. Mm. 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 That's such a good question. Um, mm. Okay. Uh, some, I mean, it comes from all directions. I'd say first and foremost, it'll come like through the community, um, through these uh, monthly park shows. I'll often discover new musicians that I haven't heard of before through that. Um, my partner is an amazing music researcher. He has such a much more of a vast musical knowledge than I do. So he's constantly introducing me um, to music that I've never heard of and that I love. Um, I am sad to admit that sometimes it also comes through Spotify's algorithms, <laughs> but yeah, often delivers me things that I love. Yeah, you know, it definitely, uh, especially if I'm really dialed in with the playlist that I'm making that when I, mm. I love using the um, radio function of Spotify. Like if I really Same. love a song or an album or an artist, it'll generate a new yeah. playlist based on that. Um, so I use that function frequently. Um, I do love just like crate digging, you know, I like, um, I like to buy random, you know, especially like um old records that I don't know what they are like I got this wonderful like Russian folk uh choir I like I like I love buying old choir records um you know it, there's just like so many interesting and beautiful uh albums that have been recorded throughout time there's literally like I tried to make a list of all of the artists that I wanted to talk to you about it's literally like <laughs> hundreds I don't know <laughs> it's totally insane um yeah I think I think uh if I'm doing it right it just comes to me sometimes it's gifted to me blessedly um yeah I'm really curious to like what the future of of this is of music discovery and like how we share with each other sometimes it'll happen on Instagram too when I think about it like someone will you know, share something in their stories and either like, uh, you know, use that function where it's like playing music behind what you're uh, looking at, or they'll just like share something from that artist and I'll discover people that way. Um, and also like, you know, um, Bandcamp has some interesting functionality for this too, where like, you know, uh, I follow Carlos Nino and he's just an incredible musical genius of all kinds but he I, I find that most things that he listens to I really enjoy cool yeah yeah that seems to be you know still the most effective is you you know you find a person whose music taste you trust and you know, yeah. then you follow along <laughs> um, this is something I'm really curious to and and we're kind of like stepping towards that with this like curatorial function and the genre garden but this is something that I feel is so precious and beautiful about our um, musical community that there's the incredible curators that are often also musicians themselves but I'm really looking for ways to channel that genius into a home you know like where you could just like look at what's what are they listening to? What are they listening to? And then 
um, let that, you know, guide you through the musical internet wildland. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I mean, that's 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 kind of what we're trying, you know, to build via the Create Coalition and via, you know, via Grey Matter in, in, in terms of, you know, just building, you know, kind of a home for human-based music discovery um, and, you know, really seeing opportunities by tracking this, you know, this kind of connective tissue between people as a really strong mechanism for, you know, building music community and, and then creating um, more meaningful support structures for artists as well. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, we can continue this conversation afterwards, but I think our heads are in the same spot <laughs> with this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'd love that. Um, cool. Uh, okay, cool. Who who are three artists of note that you've heard for the first time in, you know, let's say the past year or so? Oh, my gosh. And the last year? Okay, it's a little bit further back than that, but I'll say I probably like heard him like maybe like a year and a half ago or two years maybe. Um, but Alabaster de Plume is someone I really uh, instantly. He's on international anthem. So I recently found out um, that they like they they met him. The the label they connected with him because they were like he was working in a recording studio in the UK where they were recording something with one of their artists. Like he was just like working at the front desk or maybe like as an engineer, I don't know, but they just like connected with him. And he's kind of a lot like Carlos. Well, they played, I saw him play a show with Carlos and a band that Carlos put together, but they're sort of like, you know, um, <laughs> musical brothers in this way where there's, uh, they both have this like collaborative process in their music, music uh, making. So like often, I think Alabaster, he mostly plays with musicians who he's never, Carlos is a little different, but maybe Alabaster, he like, plays with musicians he's never played with before. In the show I saw, it was a group of musicians because he came here from the UK and um, I think Carlos put together the band. They played a floating show actually at the same park where we, we do these monthly concerts. Mm -hmm. And um, it was so stunningly gorgeous. I was sobbing the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, it was just so beautiful. And um, yeah, I love this improvisational, playful, nature of that creative uh, process and um and also this uh, there's something really beautiful in his music that's speaking to what we were talking about earlier of my experience first first making music of trying to be something I wasn't there's this theme that runs through Alabaster's music about uh, I think he says like remember that you're precious you know um really like honoring the uniqueness of self um, that I think is so beautiful and so needed. Um, I really do feel that that's like part of the healing that's needed on the planet right now of this, yeah. you know, this feeling of not enoughness, that we can't just be who we are, that we need to try to be something or someone other than our true nature. And yeah, yeah. And then, okay, wait, I have to look at my list to see who have I really just discovered. Because, I mean, it's kind of hard for me to know, like, who and or when these people came into my, um, yeah. into my musical recent, past. recent yeah. years. Okay, let's say um, Sharda Shashidar. I mean, that's not a year because we collaborated. So the first galactic wave performance which is another one of these participatory musical movement performances was with uh it was at in the very beginning right before the pandemic it was one of the last things i did before the pandemic happened um at the beginning of um uh 2020 um it was in a group exhibition at the la municipal art gallery which is a public uh, gallery here in LA like they don't sell anything the whole intention of the gallery is for the public experience and enjoyment and um, we did a performance with um, I think we had like 12 choir members and then in the band it was Carlos Carlos put together the band it was Carlos Sharda Jamel Dean and Aaron Shaw of Black Nile and um, so that's when I first met her, um, but she, she makes her own records as well. She puts uh, out music with leaving records. And um, she is one of these musicians that I saw her play this, uh, this house concert called uh, Rent Stew in Limerick Park like last year. 
and I was sobbing again. <laughs> so just like she goes to an otherworldly place. Her voice is just otherworldly. The music's beautiful and um yeah, just like takes it to another dimension. It's really insane watching her perform. It was like just completely transcendent. Cool. Okay, and you want one more. Who on this list is really that new in my life? Okay, okay. Not new, not new, not new. <laughs> um, I was like, just, just really, um, okay. Not really new also, but um, how can I choose just one? Okay, um, Low Leaf. She's an amazing uh, harpist and uh, vocalist as well. She releases beautiful, beautiful music. She just released a single with Leaving uh, called How to Open a Portal that was actually recorded. It's a recording that she did live at uh, a park show, one of the Leaving Records park shows, uh, like just oh. like two or three months ago. And this one song, is, I mean, it's just extraordinary. It's so beautiful. And they just released it as a single. Um, and she and Matthew David are playing uh, in Ojai at the Listening Garden on 11.11, 11, um, which is sure to be a beautiful, beautiful experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, cool, I'd love to go to that, but it's, you know, LA and Ojai are not, are not close to where <laughs> I am, alas. <laughs> where are you, by the way, McKeegan? I don't even know. I uh, live in London. London, okay, beautiful. Yeah. Oh yeah. man, I'm so curious. It's like a whole other musical world there. It I wanted is. to also show you this book, Quantum Listening by Paulina Oliveros. Oh. I, I know Have this. Have you seen it I before? This, I read this book actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. This uh, came to me much more recently, but it has uh, awakened and amplified my excitement about these participatory musical experiences and also like this idea of deep listening, you know, of real presence. This is something I've been thinking a lot about. So like these monthly park shows that Leaving holds, they're so beautiful. They're big. It's like, I don't know, at least 500 people usually, maybe more. I've never tried to count, but it's quite large. It's in a big park, but it can get quite loud um, because people are like picnicking and having fun and socializing. And that's part of what makes it beautiful, but I've been really thinking deeply on like how to cultivate a um, deep listening practice or to like naturally without like commanding or demanding it, but like inviting the community to listen more deeply while the musicians are playing. And, um, you know, it's like, it's a really interesting question. I, I've been unsure, like how, how do you invite people into that without, you know, making it this like I'm telling you what to do or like you know yeah. like trying to insist on something but like how do you cultivate an ethos it's really about an ethos of care right like that you're like in presence that we're um and it's not that that doesn't happen also but like some like there's this one day it was so hot um and so we like everyone sat much closer to the stage than normal because um, the shade of the tree was protecting everyone from the sun. So everyone got like really, really close, but that like amplified the talking sound. And it also like created like a, a circle around the, uh, around the musicians. And the whole time it just like felt like, <laughs> I wish that I could um, like, and make everyone go silent <laughs> just for, uh, just for the the time of the musician on stage you know it's like th this kind of teleports me back to those early days of pursuing music myself professionally that so many of the shows I was playing was in bars and people weren't really like listening um you know it was like kind of people were drunk or loud or whatever and I think um you know that that's a uh I think like I have been in some spaces and, and, and this, this space does take on this deep listening quality um, depending on the context and the music that's being shared. But I think like bringing that into the musical experience is so profound. Like 
to allow, um, you know, this genuine reciprocity. Like, I love the way that um, she talks about it in this book of it's like that it becomes um, this active relationship and conversation between the audience and the musicians. And I remember there's something in here that like there was this one concert she played where she didn't play any instruments. She was just listening to the audience. Um, like while another musical collaborator was playing and like that was the whole performance. Cool. I love that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, um yeah, I mean, I need to revisit this book because it feels like such a blip because it's so short, you know, it just, you know, it's something I read mm -hmm. and, then it, and then it was gone and uh, I need to go back to it um, because it's such a fascinating idea, this you know, concept of quantum listening. Um, and you know, especially like the reciprocity, that aspect of it. It it it, it also reminds me of um. Um, I interviewed this this guy Elliot Sharp once, who's like an experimental guitarist in New York. Um, and he described it as like a pheromonal handshake, like like we were talking about, like the social acoustics of like being in a space with music with other people yeah i mean so we were having this conversation right at the beginning of the pandemic so this is like you know kind of a hot topic of like i mean you know you lived through it <laughs> of when we couldn't be together but <laughs> the importance mm -hmm. of of you know being together and really diving into you know like the actual chemistry um or you know in the case of the quantum you know the like actual physical you know kind of properties of what it means to be together and share space, especially, you know, when music is, is you know, there and involved and like that, that's the focal point. Um, yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah, I think coming back together after that time, um, it really brought a new appreciation for experience of live music and being together and experiencing it I think you know the feeling of being immersed in music especially music that's really moving uh, or moves you you know it's an individual highly individual experience but um, it's so profound it's so profound it's I think music is one of the great unifying forces in the cosmos it really has this capacity to bring us together across all lines and um, you know that feeling that feeling that that like being moved by a piece of music it's such a palpable ineffable quality of experience and one I treasure above most um, not better or worse or like more or less but it's it's I really do feel that music can transform consciousness and that it can awaken something in us that is latent or yeah. needs healing. Yeah, I agree. Um, I've been kind of attaching my self to string to to a string theory. I've been reading about string theory recently, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. most of it is way above my head. Like, I, I don't. I don't understand the mathematics of it or anything, but but the notion that uh, you know the kind of the foundational you know kind of, kind of like particulate of everything are these you know tiny little strings uh, and you know their length and how they vibrate dictate you know like how they manifest in the world um, mm -hmm. is you know so I really like the idea that the reason that we are you know, so touched and so moved by music is is because, like, you know, quite literally, we we are vibrating when we hear music, and like, mm -hmm. in, you know, it will resonate in different ways inside of us uh, because that is what we are, strings. Um, mm, that's beautiful. I don't know if that's true. I mean, it hasn't, you know, been proven like through. Uh, uh, you know, it's like still in the realm of theory and I think will be for a long, long time, but I like the idea. <laughs> it feels uh, resonant to me. Yeah, there's something about it that feels right. 
but we can feel it right like that feeling of um vibration right like vibrational alignment um, when we come into contact with something that feels vibrationally aligned <laughs> nervous system in a very particular yeah. way Totally, as long as we stay tuned to it. <laughs> <laughs> Always listen, deep listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, here's another question for you. Uh, most underappreciated <laughs> artists from your favorite music decade? Oh, oh. Uh, I think I have to say Carlos Nino and friends. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I would say he's underappreciated. I think he has a deep well of support and community and, and fans throughout the, the world and probably throughout the cosmos, I might anticipate as well. Um, I love his, I love the music that Carlos makes. It's so rich and varied and full of interesting collaborators. And he's such an incredible steward of music community. Um, it's really extraordinary also just like the depth of the of the catalog he's made um he just made a new website that has his whole like catalog in it so you can kind of look at the record covers um i think it's nf archive i can't remember what the tld is but i'll share it to you um he just sent it out with his newsletter and um yeah, I've I've listened to so much of his music over the years and seen him perform so many times with different collaborators. And I really uh, feel that the music that he stewards into reality uh, does very palpably touch the spirit, um, my spirit, so certainly. And, you know, it touches on this. Um, mm this quality of beingness in the world that is rooted in love and expansive, exploratory, experimental, collaborative creativity and just really embodies what I hope the future of music is of this, you know, like this dismantling of the like rigid structure of you're in this band and you make this kind of music and you have this kind of audience, but that you can collaborate uh, with many different musical people and styles and and uh you know like allow the best of everyone to come forth into that container mm. cool i love that yeah i mean one of my takeaways from this conversation is that i need to spend more time with carlos nino's music <laughs> <laughs> don't mean to be such a stan uh yeah but like i really i really love it i listen to it a lot when i'm working in the studio um it's uh yeah, I've been a been a guide and you know, we've collaborated as well, but I just I I really do uh you know, it's like some music really brings you into your feeling body and I really feel that way. Um I really about feel that way about this. It's it awakens new dimensions in my consciousness and awakens emotion excites me also i think like i just get inspired also in his process and excited to collaborate with others and you know a lot of his records now he takes uh recordings uh he from live concerts and then uh you know creates records um collaging i think also i don't know exactly the the whole process but he like will take sections from live performances and then maybe like layer in new uh, recordings on top of that and yeah i think i'm just i'm really inspired by the process of creation and the kinds of artists that he collaborates with and uplifts and supports in their own practices and as collaborators and he's a really like um i think he's a really important uh, steward of this community and uh, is really creating a safe container, a safe and beautiful container for the artists here to flourish. Cool. I love that. Um, cool. So now, now here's the big question for you. Uh, you are, <laughs> are, 
are going to a desert island and you get to bring three records with you, what are they? Ooh. Oh my gosh, that's like, that's like almost impossible, almost it impossible. I, th I think um, it is impossible, but uh, that's what makes it It is impossible. Holy crap. Um, oh, my gosh. This is, this is impossible. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> also, like, I feel like I don't know the names of any of these records. I know the artists, and I don't know the record names, so I have to double check so that I don't say it wrong. Um, okay. I will probably say, um, I think it's called Please Wake Up a Little Faster. Okay, so obviously have to have a, a Carlos record. I think I would choose this re relatively new one, More Energy Fields Current, which has one of my favorite songs, um, Please Wake Up a Little Faster, <laughs> the lead track. Um, and then... Oh my gosh, this is like really, really hard. <laughs> really I know, hard. I know. Also, I feel like I would like not choose Carlos since I've been shouting him out so much at this point, but I really would. Um, I would definitely probably choose. I can't say which. I will. I will say. I would. I'm also a huge, huge Hiatus Coyote fan. Mm, I too. love all of their records. And I love singing with it. I saw them perform. I saw Napalm perform solo when she put out her solo record in Brooklyn in Williamsburg at the Williamsburg. Um, gosh, what's that venue called? I'm not so familiar with the New York venues. Uh, the Williamsburg Music Hall, I think that's what it's called. Uh -huh. yeah. I saw her play solo, just her and a guitar. The whole audience was singing. The it's going to make me cry just even saying it. The whole audience was like standing and singing with her. And it was literally just her and a guitar. It was so one of the most beautiful performances I've ever seen in my life. And I just, I love, I, I guess maybe I'll say choose your weapon to be able uh, to like, I don't know. But then the new record is amazing. I saw that. Then we saw them play at the Ho Hollywood Bowl, like the whole band. And I think like LA Philharmonic played with them too. Um, with Miguel Atwood Ferguson conducting, um, who's also uh, like has collaborated many, many times uh, with Carlos. Um, I love the records they've made together too. They're just, oh, so he's a violinist um, and a composer. And uh, he also works as, a, well, as a conductor as well. He, we just also saw him do the um, Floating Points um, um, Pharaoh Sanders tribute. Um, with Shabaka uh, Hutchins and um, at the Hollywood Bowl, um, where he conducted the the orchestra there as well. Cool. Um, okay, okay, this is so hard. This is so hard. <laughs> I might have You're to say great. Sam to and already. Sam. I know. Okay, it's really hard. I would say Alice Coltrane. Nice. Um, this like best of record that they put out, um, like posthumously. That music. Um, that music really moves my whole being. Um, yeah, I was I was introduced to her by Carlos actually, and I really didn't know much about her. And um, yeah, the first time I heard it, I was just floored. I can't. I was like, I didn't even know this kind of music existed. <laughs> it really just like you know. Um, and we saw a beautiful, a beautiful tribute concert last year on her birthday in um, downtown. Um, Syria Botafacina, who grew up in the community that she was a part of, the ashram. Um, his his parents were both musicians um, that played with her, and um, they were both a part of this concert as well as uh, as well as many other musicians uh, in the musical community here. Um, but they played this beautiful tribute for her birthday last year. Um, she's not present, obviously, no longer on the planet, but um, yeah, and then. I know you said three, but a close second, I will say Sam and Sam, Sam Gundel and Sam Wilkes. Uh, that record, just, I just love it so much. I I really listen to it all the time. So I would love to have that with me. I will probably like try to sneak one into a sleep. <laughs> yeah, sneak two discs. <laughs> sneak, a, sneak a fourth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, right. Yeah. all right. We can let that slide, I think. Uh, 
Okay. <laughs> Tony, I was listening to Alice Coltrane earlier today, and and um, yeah, she she is amazing. I mean, you know, she she I think has gotten a bit overshadowed by her husband. Um, but a hundred. Yeah, I mean, she definitely has. But uh, you know, her music is obviously very different from John's, but I I. I would say equally incredible. It 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 is really you know really distinct and really you know really moving. I was thinking about Alice when you were talking about music and like your music making and like you know throughout this conversation I was thinking of her. I thought you might pick something by her or mention her at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, honored by that correlation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, she she's really an extraordinary force, and um, yeah, the music itself is just like. It has such a spiritual power imbued in the music. You can really feel the energy. Um, even, you know, all these years after it was created, it feels really timeless to me. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I have so much love and appreciation for her spirit and um, the energy that she channeled into that form and, like, all the voices, you know. It's, like, it's got so much... Um, Mm, it's so vibrant, so vital. Yeah, agreed. Um, cool, cool, Alana, you've made it through the gauntlet. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, now, now an, an easy question for you: Where, uh, you know, for people listening, where can people check out, you know, your work and the projects um, that you're involved in and the art that you're making? What's the best place for them, you know, to go follow along, check it out? Yeah, um, I've just moved my site to a new URL. It's uh, lani.earth. <laughs> cool. Um, and uh, genre.garden is the URL for the community website that we're building. Uh, also, you can go to the Leaving Records website to see more of the music. <laughs> my cat's like decided she really needs some love right, right meow. Um, That's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so you could go to the leavingrecords.com, I think is the URL as well, if you want to check out the artists um, on the label. And uh, yeah, that's, I think that's about it. Amazing. Um, and one last question for you, now that you've been on the show, um, is there anyone yeah. else that comes to mind who you think would, would be, a, you, know, you know, any other music head that comes to mind who you think would be a good guest, you know, to have? Oh my gosh, so many. Um, <laughs> definitely my genre collaborator, Jacques Lev uh, Jack Slovaka. Um, mm. Jack has been collecting records since she was a teenager, and she's actually um, like co owner or co let's say steward, co steward of a very mega record collection with another collector that I think the, the collection lives in Pasadena at his house. Um, but she has a very vast musical knowledge. Um, mm. I would say would be a wonderful, wonderful uh, conversation for you two to have. Amazing. But I could like give you a list of like 30 people also. <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, I will trust you and I will come back to you for that list at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, feel free. <laughs> um, well, cool. This has, you know, been really amazing, Lonnie. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and, and all the work that you do. Um, you know, it's been you know, it's really been a pleasure to connect. Thank you so much, Mickey Vanilla. Likewise, thank you for the invitation to speak on these things. And uh, it's been really wonderful sharing space with you all today. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you again for being here. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, let's uh, connect you know, again soon. Yeah, be well. Yeah, you too. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Talk soon.